Frames, whether visible or invisible, are the backbone of our layouts. But when we apply some style properties, frames also become a key player in visual design. In today's lesson, we're looking at the style properties of frames and how powerful they are in shaping the appearance of our sites. For this lesson, we probably could start with a completely blank, empty frame, but there are some visual properties that interact with the content inside of a frame. So we're instead gonna start with this card that is a frame, an invisible frame, has no visual properties applied to it whatsoever, and that frame has some content inside, some text boxes and some icons and a button. So with this parent frame selected, we're gonna come down on the properties panel a bit, all the way down to styles. Now there are a bunch of properties here in the style section. I'm not gonna go through them in the order that they appear. I'm gonna go through them in a slightly different order that I think makes a little more sense for this lesson. I'm gonna start with fill because right now, like I said, there are no visual properties applied to this card whatsoever and the card is essentially invisible. So a fill is a pretty good place to start. I'll click here to add a fill and we get our color picker where we can choose at the very top between a solid fill, a gradient fill, a radial gradient fill, a conic gradient fill, which goes around kind of like a pinwheel. And then last, we have the image fill. Now, I'm not going to dig too far into image fills because in a previous lesson, we unpacked images and image fills and how all that stuff works. So instead, I'll put a link in the description so you can refer back to that lesson if you just so happen to miss it. But one thing I do want to point out here is no matter what kind of fill you're using, you'll notice it is behind the content within the frame. If you look at the layer list, it might look like the card is above its children in the stacking order, but that's not really what's going on. The parent is sort of wrapped around its children. And what that means is the fill goes behind everything. And you'll see in a moment, the border actually goes in front of everything and the content is sandwiched in between. Cool. So with that out of the way, I'm just going to go back to a regular solid fill and I'm going to leave it on white. I think that's just fine. So that is the gist of fills. And since fills are an optional property, just as easily as I clicked to add the fill, there's also a little X icon over here where I can click to remove the fill altogether. And the same goes for borders and shadows. They're optional. We start without them. We can add them. We can remove them. So let's do that for a border. I'm going to click to add a border. By default, we get a black border here, and we have a width value that we can play with to make the border thicker or thinner. We do also have the option of switching between editing the border for all of the sides or splitting them apart and editing the border for individual sides, the top, right, bottom, and left. If we play with these values here, you can see that increasing one does not affect the others whatsoever. But if I switch back to this mode, we're back to that single field where we control all four borders at the same time. And like I mentioned before, the border is on top of everything. So where the border intersects with content within its frame, it's actually going to cover that content up. You also may have noticed that borders are positioned inside the frame. So by making the border larger, you're not making the frame larger. It's not going to protrude outside the frame. Rather than being center aligned or outside aligned, they're inside aligned always. Then last, we can change the style of the frame between solid, dashed, dotted, or a double line. I'm gonna leave this on solid, and the very last thing I wanna point out is the opacity of the border. If we wanna reduce the opacity of the border, we actually go into the color and we reduce the alpha of the color. So if you're looking for opacity and you're wondering where that property is, that is mixed in with the color picker here. Now that we've got a border applied and it's really easy to see those hard pointy corners, I want to show you how to round those corners if you want to. That is the radius property. So by increasing the radius, it's by default going to increase the corner radius of all four corners at the same time. But again, just like the border, we can choose to split those values apart and we can say, you know, make the top right more or less round, make the bottom right more or less round, et cetera, et cetera. And we can take full control over the roundness of each corner independently. Cool. Now that we've got a fill and a border and we played with the corner radius, I'm thinking it would be a natural time to go over shadows. So when we click to add a shadow, the first thing I want to point out is there's another add button under shadows. You can actually add more than one shadow to a frame. You can stack them up if you want to, or you can combine an inside shadow with an outside shadow. So more on that right now. If we head over to the dialog that appears, we do get to choose between an outside or inside shadow. 
by default, we have an outside shadow. It's kind of hard to see right now, but if I increase the Y dimension, which is going to move it up and down, now you can see it sticking out the bottom. The Y dimension can also be a negative number. The X or Y can be a negative number to control its offset from the center. Then using the blur property, we can make the shadow a bit softer and the spread property will allow us to increase or decrease the size of the shadow to make it look like the shadow is coming from maybe a small light source that's projecting super far outward or from a larger light source that's kind of wrapping around the sides. But if you want an even more realistic shadow, rather than using the typical box shadow, which is basically just the shape of your layer blurred behind itself, we have the option of adding a realistic shadow instead. Now, what a realistic shadow is going to do is automatically stack several shadows that give us a more convincing effect. If I bring the diffusion all the way up and I bring the focus all the way up, you can see that there are actual several hard shadows here that are stacked on top of one another. By adjusting the diffusion, we adjust how quickly those shadows fall off. And by adjusting the focus, we can make them more or less blurry. So with the diffusion and focus and kind of a happy middle ground, we do end up with a shadow that's quite a bit more realistic than a single typical box shadow. And if you're not getting the subtlety that you want from playing with the diffusion and focus, you may just want to reduce the opacity of the whole thing. That, again, just like a border, is going to be within the color picker. So here I can dial the opacity up or down, give myself kind of a more subtle result here. Speaking of opacity, we've also got an opacity slider for this whole frame. And you'll notice that when you bring the opacity down, it brings down the opacity of the visual properties of this frame and all of its children because they're all kind of bundled together. They're all behaving as one unit. It's a container. It's like a group. It all comes down in opacity together. But there's also a property here called visible. And some folks get visibility and opacity a little bit mixed up. So let's clarify that. If I bring opacity all the way down to zero, yes, this is no longer visible, but it's not the same as setting visibility to none because you'll notice that there's still a frame that appears on my canvas. And when I mouse over these things, these things are still here. Visible makes them disappear from the canvas. It's like they're not there. And one of the ways in which that can impact your design is if, for example, I have several of these cards. Let me duplicate this card real quick with Command D. And uh, I'm actually going to select both of these and I'm going to wrap them in a stack. I'm going to press Option Command Return on my Mac and I'm going to make this a horizontal stack. So now I have two of these cards next to each other. And just for good measure, I'm going to duplicate again. So we've got a stack of three cards. Now, if I select any one of these and I reduce its opacity down to zero, the layout is preserved. The card's still there. It's just visually transparent. Anywhere in the middle, it's translucent. All the way up, it's opaque. But if I switch the visibility to no, now the card disappears and the layout acts as though that card never existed in the first place. So that's important. When you're working with stacks, grids, anything with relative layers, when you switch the visibility of something from yes to no, it removes it from the document flow. It removes it from the flow of the stack and everything else behaves as though that object doesn't exist. So that's the big difference between visibility and opacity right there. The last property we haven't talked about here is overflow, which by default is set to hidden. And if I click away, you can see that those shadows that I created earlier are now cut off. What happened? Well, that frame that I wrapped around these cards to turn them into a stack has the overflow set to hidden, which means anything that goes beyond the boundary of that frame is going to get clipped off. So all we need to do is with that parent frame selected, just come down here and switch the overflow from hidden to visible. And now child elements can protrude beyond the boundaries of that parent frame. Now, the third option for overflow is scroll. And I'm not going to apply that to this frame here. Instead, I'm going to grab the frame within this card that has all these bullet points in it. And I'm going to switch the height from fit to fixed so that it can't get taller when I add more content to it. Now I'm going to grab one of these bullet points. I'm going to duplicate it just so that I can have more stuff in there than fits. Now, with the parent frame selected that's containing those items, I'm going to scroll down here and I'm going to switch the overflow here from visible to scroll. And scroll is going to clip the content, kind of like hidden does. But if we go and preview this, this is now a scrollable container. So whatever the difference is between the size of the frame itself and the content within the frame becomes scrollable. That simple. 
One last thing I want to point out is that in addition to the default set of properties that shows up here, there is a plus sign where you can access some more advanced properties. So we have blending modes in here. We can decide whether or not an image is draggable. We can add all these great filters. We can add a mask. There's a lot of cool stuff going on in here. So be sure to check these items out too. And that's it. Now you know how the default style properties of a frame can shape these otherwise inconspicuous rectangles into core visual design elements. And you know where to find even more advanced visual properties like blending modes, filters, and masks. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one.